wrists and you think of chains around the ankle and even in ancient times you might have a chain around your neck. Those were chains of steel and chains of iron and those were chains of restraint and you were forced to do uh, what your captain asked you to do and you were in bondage. But Paul wants us to understand that as a prisoner of the Lord, he doesn't have chains of iron and steel around his hands, around uh, his ankles, or around his neck. Uh, but he has chains of gratitude, or a chain of love, and a chain of mercy. Because you see, Paul uh, understood who he was. And he understood that the Lord had saved him from who he was and from what he was doing. Paul was someone who was a violent man. Uh, he was a persecutor of the church. Paul was someone who would drag out men and women. He would drag them out of their home and put them into prison. As a matter of fact, Paul was responsible for the first martyr, for the first person who was killed because of the faith in Acts chapter 7. That was Stephen. As a matter of fact, if you read that chapter, you'll find at the end they laid Stephen's clothes at the feet of a man named Saul. They were talking about Paul because Paul oversaw Stephen's death. So he was a persecutor. He was a violent man. He did everything that he could to destroy those who said that they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, I am now bound to the Lord. I know that the Lord saved me even from my mother's womb. He knew who I was. He knew what I had done. And yet Paul, he Paul, Paul was saying, God still had mercy upon me. And he showed me the grace to bring me into the faith. Even in spite of all the things that I had formerly done. So when Paul says I'm a prisoner of the Lord, I believe mean Paul is saying to the church in Ephesus, he is saying, even though I'm a prisoner of the Lord, when I am bound to the Lord, that is when I am truly free. I'm free to be all that God would have me to be. I'm free to serve the Lord. I'm free to serve the body of Christ. I'm free to serve members of that body. I think Paul is really saying to the church, because he said it so often in his letters, he's saying, I want you to be like me. I want you to be imitators of me. I want you to follow me as I follow the Lord. If I am a prisoner of the Lord, then you ought to be a prisoner of the Lord as well. But you're not bound again by chains of iron. You're not put in a jail cell, but you're bound. You ought to be as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. You ought to be bound by chains of love, by chains of gratitude, by chains of mercy. How many of you are thankful for what the Lord has done for you? How many of you are thankful? I'm sure everybody will put up there and praise God for that. What about brothers and sisters? If you are thankful, if you have a spirit and an attitude of gratitude, then you ought to be bound to the Lord. You ought to be a prisoner for the Lord. You ought to do whatever the Lord says you ought to do. You ought to go wherever the Lord says you ought to go. You ought to be engaged that the Lord said you ought to be engaged in. Because when you are a prisoner of the Lord, like Paul, then that is when you are truly free. That's when you're free. Paul says, and says, he goes on to say, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you, he said, to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Now, to live a life worthy of the calling you have received, according to Paul, it must be done in relationship or in relation to other members of the body of Christ. You can't live a life worthy of this calling in isolation. Uh, you can't do it on your own. You can't do it by yourself. A worthy life is not a life of individual accolades or individual effort, but it's a life of team effort as far as Paul is concerned if you are a member of the body of Christ. As a matter of fact, I find it interesting that Paul says to the members of the church, he says, live a life worthy of your calling. Isn't that something? In other words, Paul is saying all of us have been called by the Lord to do ministry. Not just the preacher. Not, not, that's how we think of it in the market. Not just the preacher, but everybody, every single one of us who proclaim that Jesus is Lord, we have a calling. And that calling is something that we must live out. It is something that we must work out. Listen, by how we treat each other. Not just by how we treat strangers. Not just by how we may treat the biological members of our family. But it's about how we treat the members of the body of Christ. How do you relate to each other? So Paul says, he says in verse 2, if you're going to live a life worthy of the calling, and you're going to do this in relationship to other members, one of the things that you've got to do in how you treat other members and how you get along with each other is that you've got to be, listen to what it says, he says, you've got to be completely honorable. 
You've got to be completely humble and gentle. In other words, and this is really a mindset, but you've got to lower yourself like Christ did, and you must be willing to serve others. And, 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 and being gentle means that you've got to be considerate of those who are around you. Huh? You've got to be considerate. And then he said you've got to be patient. And I believe he really defines what he's talking about in this verse. He says, be patient. And he said, bearing with one another in love. Huh? you got to, hey, Paul knew what it meant to be in community. And he's saying you got to be able to bear with one another. Uh, you got to be able to, to put up with each other. And, and you got to do it in a spirit of love, in a spirit of humility, in a spirit of gentleness. You've got to respect the people around you. But like we study in the book of Acts, and like we studied in John the 13th chapter, and like we studied in 1 Corinthians the 12th chapter, as members of the body of Christ, you got to be willing to be together. You got to be willing to get face to face, body to body. You got to get to know each other in informal setting. You got to be devoted to the Word of God and to each other, not just to the Word, not just to yourself, not just to your own occupation, but you got to be devoted to each other. And Paul said, you know, we got to do all of these things because we got some things in common. He says, he says, and I believe he says in uh, verse four, he says to the church, there is one body. All right, one body, we belong to the same spiritual community. We're all connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. He said there is one spirit. The one spirit brought us into the body of Christ, and the spirit has given light to our spirit so that we, as individuals, are no longer dead to God. He said there is one hope, that one hope being that we all hope one day to be exalted with Christ, that we will be a part of the kingdom of God and live with Christ forever and ever. That's the hope that Paul is talking about. He said there is one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Savior who died for our sin. There is one faith, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and there is not another. Faith only in Him. He said there's one baptism, there's an outward baptism by water, there's an inward baptism by the Spirit that has sealed our entrance into God's family. And then finally he said there's one God, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who sent Jesus. He is our Creator, and he says he is over all and through all, and he is in all. Those things we have in common. That's what Paul is saying. He said the, the, those seven things, the body, the Spirit, the hope, the Lord, one God, those are things that cement our unity. Alright? And so if we have these things in common, then we ought not let peripheral differences in opinion divide us, right? Uh, church has never met something like speaking in tongues. Divide it. That's what Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 12 chapter. Denominations really should not divide us. He talked about it in Corinthians 2. Some say I'm a Paul. Some say I'm a Apollos. Some say I'm a Stephen. Some say I'm a Jesus Christ. Paul said you're all wrong because you're dividing yourself into factions and you do not yet recognize that you are members of the same community. He's saying most baptism should divide us. But it should be by immersion, sprinkling, types of music. What? Should divide us. Huh? If, if the music clearly has a gospel message, then that should divide us. But all Paul says, individually, he says, but, but corporately, we are uh, one body. Okay, then he goes on to verse 7, says, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ a portion. Grace has been given as Christ a portion. This means, when he's talking about grace here, he's talking about enablement. That's the kind of grace that Paul is talking about. And so basically what this text is telling us, what Paul is saying to the Ephesian church, what he's saying to us today, is Christ has enabled each one of us to serve. Christ has enabled each one of us to minister. Christ has enabled us to have gifts in order that we might be a blessing to each other. Now the idea in verses 8 through 10, I didn't read 9 and 10, uh, but the idea is taken from Psalm 68. And I, I guess you can close your Bible, but in, in verse 8, it talks about when he ascended on high, talking about Christ. 
and he led captives in his train, and he gave gifts to men. The idea in that Psalm 68 is that Christ, in his death, in his resurrection, and in his ascension, is seen in the spiritual realm as a military conqueror, right? In other words, uh, the Lord Jesus, when he came here upon this earth, he broke into Satan's domain, and he took back uh, what the enemy had stolen from him. Uh, he rescued, he delivered, he saved, he took back men and women who were once held captive by Satan and by the powers of darkness. That's why Paul, when he ascended on high, he led captives, uh, he led people who had been redeemed in his train, and he gave gifts to men. That's how Paul saw uh, Psalm 68. That's what Psalm 68 was talking about. They didn't know that before Christ. But after Christ came, they said, that's who they're talking about. When he ascended on high, after his resurrection, he led all of us in here. He led us captives in the long train of his road, right? And then when he got up there, he turned around and he gave gifts to men. He gave us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has enabled us to do work as individuals and as collectively has enabled us to do ministry for the body of Christ and for the world. Do you follow what I'm saying? Do you see how good God is? Do you see how good our Lord is? You didn't even know somebody that you were a captain. You didn't even know that the Lord
or sometimes 60 times over, or sometimes 100 times over. In other words, the Word of God, the seed, uh, has a way of multiplying in a person's life until that person becomes a reflection of what the Word of God stands for. Right? Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you allowing the Word of God to have a primary influence in your life? Are you allowing the Word of God to have uh, the primary influence in your life? Or are you, are you in the habit of saturating you know, your mind uh, with the Word of God? Or are you following the latest advice from motivational speakers or newspaper and magazine columns or famous personalities who have no allegiance to the God you serve? Is that the primary influence in your life? Listen! People who do ministry, people who do ministry in the name of Jesus and are serious about the Word of God, they have incorporated the Word of God into their lives. Huh? Uh, they do ministry because the Word of God motivates them to serve. That's why they do it. Huh? Anybody you see doing ministry in the name of Jesus and they're serious about it, it's because somewhere along the way they have been receptive to the Word of God. That Word has taken root and is beginning to bear fruit and so they Until we become unified in the faith, Paul. 
God or the Son of God. Paul said, this is a part of what it means to become a mature, fully functioning member of the body of Christ. Right? That's what it means. To become mature, what does that mean? To become mature means that we grow up in Christ. Huh? We grow up in Christ. You know, Paul, well, let me just put it this way. But I thought if I had this analogy in mind. Uh, when I was a child, you know, sometimes I would go into my dad's closet uh, when he wasn't there. I'd try to wear his shoes. Try to wear his shoes, you know, walk around, walk around. But then, four, five, six, his shoes were too big because I still had a lot of growing to do, right? I had to get taller. Uh, my feet had to grow longer. Uh, I had to get bigger. And furthermore, my dad's father, he's so meticulous about me, he might recognize me as stuff. I mean, he was smack. I was able to take my own trash out. I was able to feed my own 
of my community and I'm able to make a contribution to it as a man. When I was a child, I couldn't do those things. When I was a child, I was easily distracted. When I was a child, I wanted to do what I wanted, when I wanted, and how I wanted to do it. He didn't know when I became a man, and what I did, I put away childish things. As we grow in the Lord, as you grow in the Lord, what are you contributing to the body of Christ? Are you doing your part? Are you doing your share of ministry? Your share of the work? Have your eyes been open to participate in a productive way in the community in which God has placed you? If that is not the case, then don't you think it is time for you to start growing in your faith? Don't you think it is time for you to show more gratitude and efforts toward the one who gave his very life so that you might be a part of the kingdom of God? Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. Yeah. I thought like a child. I understood as a child. But when I became a man, he said, I put away childish things. I put those things behind me. My brothers and sisters, I'm simply saying that together. As a community of faith, we can and we are designed to grow up in Christ. We are designed, uh, we are destined to leave childish ways behind us. Huh? We are designed, we're destined to stop being so self-centered. We are designed to be destined to be together as members of the body of Christ. Let us, as members, grow up, grow up together, and work together so that we might know who Christ really is and serve him in the way that he would have for us to serve him. Amen. you walk down that aisle, we'll meet you halfway, and we will help you, and we will introduce you to the man, and he'll give you a new life. Let's stand and sing.